growing up. And so, as is often the case in those situations, tensions were high, stress was high, so he and his brother and sister uh, fought like cats and dogs, and mom and dad didn't always uh, come down with the right um, discipline, and maybe in the correct way, they were not Christians. Um, and so my dad did not grow up in a Christian home, with, and he did not grow up with a spiritual leader in the house, and, and tensions were really high, like I said, and so he didn't really get a good um, picture of God growing up. In fact, uh, it was, it was kind of so bad that even as teens, uh, when, the, when their family economy got better and they started to make some money on the farm and that tension kind of eased, it was kind of too late. They were already kind of, all the brothers and sisters kind of like, as soon as we get out of here, we're like, you know, we're, we're leaving. And so my uncle joined the Navy, enlisted in the Navy, took off, uh, traveled around the world. My aunt um, ran off with her boyfriend uh, to be estranged for the next 10 years or so. Uh, and the family just kind of shattered, just kind of broke apart. Now, now individually, they, they were okay. I mean, my dad could get along with my parents, and, you know, my brother, my uncle could, but my sister, but not together. They, wouldn't, they would not be together again for quite some time. Um, but my grandmother would tell you that she did one thing right. She took her kids to church. <laughs> um, and she, she got it for a little bit of rest, you know, reprieve from the, from the ornery kids. Um, and for my uncle... Um, he was kind of like my grandfather. The church is full of hypocrites. Why would I want to go there? What does it have for me? I've got no interest in church. My aunt is kind of the same way. But my dad, uh, for whatever reason, by God's grace, he, he said, maybe there's something more. Maybe there's something more for my life. Maybe God can do something with my life. And so when he graduated high school, he went off to the Coast Guard, the first person in his family to go to college. And he began to pursue God with, with, uh, with passion and with a uh, with a fire, and um, it changed his life. So uh, I'm going to finish that story a little bit later, but I just want to take a moment right now and just uh, <laughs> hopefully without tears, uh, just thank God for, for fathers and for our Heavenly Father who steps into situations like this. So let's just bow our heads. Father, I thank you today for um, stepping out of eternity, reaching down, and pick us, picking us up. Um, Lord, I thank you for, for fathers who are... Um, doing their very best to uh, be an example in their home. I pray that you would lift them up, give them the courage they need to do that, Lord, because we know um, you can do it despite them, but you would sure like to do it with them, Lord. So I, I encourage every father in here to, to keep the mantle, to stay strong, to keep, keep the faith. And uh, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now this morning, uh, we're going to take a look at a great story because this story today in Acts chapter 10, is about um, when God extended the offer of salvation to the Gentiles. In Acts chapter 2, we, we've uh, looked at how he extended it to the Jews, and then in chapter 8, the Samaritans. But today, um, we're going to read the story about Acts 10, where he reached out to the Gentiles. And as you may know, uh, Peter was not that interested in doing that. <laughs> uh, even He... he was not a fan of the Gentiles. He kind of despised the Gentiles. They were kind of at odds, much as the Middle East is at odds with, with each other to this day. Um, it was something he was brought up knowing that, you know, you just don't associate with those people. All right? And so when God told him to go speak to the Gentiles, it would take a miracle for that to happen. And so we're going to do something a little bit different today. Um, we're going to take a look at the entire chapter of Acts 10. Because there's some stories in the Bible that they don't, need exp they don't need much explaining. This is a pretty clear story. This is a pretty great account of what happened in Peter and Cornelius' life. So if you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to open it up to chapter 10. And we're going to read um, the entire passage. I would encourage you this week to uh, go through it on your own. There's so much here. It is so deep. We could go a hundred different ways with this passage. So many lessons to be learned in this passage, but we're just going to read it together today. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three o'clock in the afternoon, he had a vision he distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. 
which I think we all would. Uh, what is it, Lord, he said. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. Now we're going to switch over to Peter's side of the story. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open like something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles of the earth and birds of the air. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him in a, a second time, Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheep was taken back to heaven. You could preach a whole sermon on why Peter always took three times for him to get stuff. But anyways, while Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about this, the, the, the spirit said to him, Simon, there are men looking for you. So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, we have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. Let me just read that again. We have come from Cornelius the centurion, the Roman centurion, who is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him, you have come to this house so that so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I'm only a man myself. Talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or visit him. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask you why you sent for me? Cornelius answered, Four days ago I was in my house praying at this hour, and at three in the afternoon suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the house of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell me. Talk about pressure, right? <laughs> okay, so for the last four days, I've been gathering all my friends, okay? So what are you going to tell us? Wow. Okay. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that, God, that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. He killed, they killed him by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one of whom God appointed as judge of all the living and the dead. And the prophets testify, testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the gospel, 
the Holy Spirit came upon all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. <laughs> Can you imagine the scene? You know, here's this centurion. Um, and, and again, we could teach a whole message probably about a centurion, but this was a high-ranking centurion uh, because we know he sent his servant on a personal errand, which was um, only allotted a high-ranking official. Um, we know that he was with his family, which was also only a uh, privilege allotted to those in, in high-ranking centurions. There was 300 different classes of centurions, so he was pretty well up uh, in the ranks. And so he gets all his friends and relatives together, and here's, you know, you can imagine maybe he's uniformed. You know, I don't know, maybe he's, you know, dressed to the nines. His family's probably pretty well off. And uh, here comes Peter the fisherman, you know, a little ragged. And uh, here he's put on the spot, kind of like all the high flute and friends, right? And he's just kind of like, I'm a little underdressed. But no, he doesn't care. He just goes in there. He, he, the Bible says he's talking to him before he even gets in the house. He's already starting to minister to him. But he gets in the house. He sees all these people. And it had to have been a little bit of a shock. But it wasn't a shock to God, was it? And I'm sure these words were ringing in his ears in John 10, 16, where Jesus had told him earlier, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. So here's what I want to look at today. First of all, God has divine appointments for us. Amen? God, God sets up divine appointments. This was a divine appointment for, for a huge purpose in history. I mean, this was, this was big. He gave Peter a vision, and Peter obeyed it. He gave Cornelius a vision, and Cornelius obeyed it. This is like a double miracle happening and coming together and changing the history of the world. And God still uses divine appointments today in your life and in my life. Do you know the research says that only 3% of non-Christians ever intend on walking into a church for anything other than a funeral or a wedding? That means less than 3% worldwide are going to go to a church for answers. But what they will do is go to you and I, Right? They will go to you and I because they know where the church is at. But they don't know those people. They don't know that pastor. They don't know that congregation. But they know you, and they've been watching you. And goes, so God sets up appointments sometimes for us. And he reminds us, as, he, as Peter writes in 1 Peter 3.15, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Now, can you imagine that meeting if Peter wasn't prepared? <laughs> it's a scary thought, isn't it? Like here he shows up for four days. Cornelius is bringing all his friends in. You got to hear this. You got to hear this. You got to hear this. And Peter shows up. and He's like, you know, God didn't tell me what I was supposed to say. Like, why didn't God tell me that? You know, why didn't he give me some clip notes or something or outline at least, right? But no, God didn't tell him what he was doing there. He, he had no idea what he was doing. He just knew he was supposed to go with these guys when they showed up, right? And um, so... Here's another thing. When they come to you and I, when, they, when these appointments happen, because we know they happen, you know, <laughs> you sit next to somebody on a plane, and they start talking, and you're like, oh, right? You're like, what? You know, and then all of a sudden, you know, it's, you know, open a book maybe, and it's like, I don't know, like Atheism 101 or something, you know, and you're like, really, God? Like, of all the people on the plane, you know? And you know he's like, he's prodding you, like, you going to strike up a conversation with this guy or? You know, and so we know these appointments happen, or maybe a neighbor comes over and goes, hey, I noticed you guys leave every Sunday morning. Where are you going? You know, or whatever. And so there's this knee-jerk reaction sometimes. What do we want to do? We want to say, well, come to church with me, right? Isn't that our natural reaction? Come to church with me. Because what we're really thinking is, like, if I can just get them to a guy that knows more than me, then I'll be okay. Because I don't want to start down this road and, like, have them pin me down on some question I don't know, and then I'm going to look for like a failure, and then God's going to be upset, you know, right? We have this, so we want to get them into church. But I told you they're not really always interested in going to church. 
God set up that appointment for you because they've been watching you and they respect you. See, these people showed up at Cornelius' house because of all the things we read about him. He gave to the poor. He was well-respected amongst the Jews. That, listen, <laughs> how does a Roman centurion get respected by the Jews? How does that work? Right? He was so above reproach. He was such a godly man, such a God-fearing man. Um, he, he had that kind of response. When he said, hey, I've got somebody that wants to talk to you, they showed up. Or maybe he just tricked them. I don't know. Maybe he told them there was going to be dessert. I don't know. But there was a lot of people there, okay? So don't hesitate to be ready to have an answer for the reason that you believe. Because they don't really want to hear why I believe. All right, if you get them here, that's great. We'll do the best we can. We will minister to them. We'll reach out to them. We will love them. But you know what? God sets those appointments up for you. And somebody's eternity lies on the other side of your obedience. And that's a hard reality, right? Because what we want to do is we want to say, well, God can do anything. He doesn't need me. And that's true. God can work around you. However, he wants you to be part of that blessing. He wants you to be part of that experience. He wants you to see him work because it will build your faith. And you'll get to have a little bit of joy when that happens, when your neighbor comes to Christ or when his family comes to Christ. He wants you to be part of that experience. He can do it without you, but that's not his plan. So we need to be sure to remember that somebody's eternity lies on the other side of our obedience. So remember, be ready, and be ready with an answer for the reason that you believe. You don't have to have. The Bible doesn't say, be prepared to give a dissertation and your theological arguments and, you know, your apologetic arguments whenever asked. No, it doesn't say that, right? It says, be prepared to give a reason why you believe what you believe. Because at the end of the day, that's really what people are interested in, isn't it? Okay, I know what the Bible says. I know what, but why do you believe? And part of the reason I told you uh, a little bit about my dad's story is because that's a little bit of my story. That's a little bit of what I believe because I saw God work in our family. And you can't argue with that. You can argue with me about theology. You can argue with me about the validity of the Bible. But you can't argue with what I've seen in my family and in my life and what God's done in my life. So be ready to have an answer. Here's the second thing I want to look at. Cornelius wasn't satisfied with his goodness, with his position, or his reputation. We see in chapter 10 that Cornelius was a devout man, which meant in the Greek that Eusebes, which means holy awe or reverence that's demonstrated by activity. By activity. See, he was devout. Not a devout, not in a monk sense, where I sit, you know, I sit in my home and, and I don't go out and I just you know, meditate on God's word and I sing songs. And, no, no, he, by action, he went out there. He gave to the poor. He helped those in need. He obviously um, had some kind of uh, example or some kind of um, influence on his staff because it says that one of his assistants, one of his soldiers, was a devout man as well. Did you catch that in the story? So even in his own battalion, if you will, he was obviously a man of great influence. He was praised by the Jews. Again, I don't know how that works. Um, we read that he was one who feared God with all his household. So he was the leader of the house. He was a spiritual leader of his house. He was a father and a husband. But the cool thing is he wasn't just seeking God for himself. A man like that, he could have said, you know, set up a private meeting with Peter. And if I like what I hear, then maybe I'll, I'll share it with my family. Right? But I'm not going to risk everything I have. I'm not going to risk my reputation. I'm not going to risk my job. I'm not going to risk my friendships. I'm not going to risk my families. These people look up to me, and I need to know what you're going to say first before I invite you to my home. No, he had the faith that said, God told me to send for this guy and to have him speak, and I know that when he comes, I want to have everybody I care about and everybody I love in the building to hear this. This is huge, okay? I don't know why God sent this vision, but it must be important. And if it's important enough for Cornelius, 
It's important enough for my whole family and everybody that I know. I love that about this guy. He cared about those that were around him, and he was willing to risk his own reputation and take a chance. And all I can imagine is that when the Holy Spirit came upon them, and and they all heard the message, they all received the gospel, that the only thought that went through his mind was, I wish I would have invited more people. Right? I I wish I would have ran to John's one more time, because maybe he was home this time. Right? Because when you see that kind of work, you just think, why didn't I tell more people? So who do we need to tell about Jesus? Who are we going to regret not telling? Who are we going to look back on and say, why didn't I try harder? Why didn't I reach out? What's keeping us from being the spiritual leader of our home? What are we afraid of losing if people know that we love Jesus? Who stands on the other side of our obedience? You know, if you knew that everyone in your household and everybody that you invited today (laughs) would come to know Christ, would come to receive the gospel, how many people would you invite? Right? But why is it we don't have that kind of faith? Because it doesn't happen? Because you've tried that? Or maybe it doesn't happen because we've not tried that and and really had had the faith that it could happen. And I'm inclusive here. Obviously, I, you know, I don't have a whole section of people I brought today. So I'm preaching and I'm speaking to myself today, as we always should. But who would we invite and who would we talk to? Who would we reach out to with the gospel if we knew that they would accept him? You know, do we have the kind of respect of our friends and our coworkers and our neighbors that if we said, hey, there's an evangelist in town, And he's going to appear at my house and he's going to talk. Come over. Would they say, yes? Or would they say, are you crazy? I just saw you the other day yelling at your dog, you know, or whatever, you know. What's our reputation like? Are, Are people, are people not interested in God? Are they just not interested in what they see God doing in our lives? That's tough, right? It's a tough reality. We're under the microscope. As I look at Cornelius, I see a great role model for Christian fathers, something we can aspire to. You know, he's a man's man, a military man, but he, he, was, he was sensitive to the needs of others. He, he gave alms to the poor. He had a heart, you know. He loved his family and his neighbors. He wanted them to know God and He's willing to risk it all to do so. So I was telling you, you know, I mentioned my dad because I think it, there's some, there's, a, there's an example in my life that, that I can look at. And when people ask me, you know, what's the reason you believe? This is one of the things I point to. But see, my dad, um, his obedience may not have changed the course of history. <laughs> like Cornelius, it may not have changed um, the times for us as Christians. We're here today because of Cornelius' obedience. But I can tell you that it changed our family. See, over time, my grandparents, um, my grandfather never would come to Christ. He never would make that decision, at least that we know of. You know, we pray that he did. Um, He he never could let up with, um, you know, the hypocrite thing. That's a tough thing to to get over when you live in a small town and you see everybody's business. um, But my my grandmother did. Uh, my cousins did. All four of my cousins received Christ. Um, my aunt passed away at an early age because of the hard living that she had, but her, her two kids are believers. And my dad continues to this day to, to call them and to visit them and encourage them to continue to take their kids to church and to, to raise them in a Christian home. And it's tragic that my aunt couldn't live out the rest of her life with that faith, but she died knowing that her kids knew Christ, and that uh, they're raising their kids to know Christ. Um, my cousins, um, my other cousins, um, my uncle has not yet accepted Christ, but uh, my dad is working on them, and we are working on them. And uh, but we're working on them with 
just living out a life of integrity, but his kids, despite his example, are both raising their kids to know Christ and to both have accepted Christ. Um, but as I look at Cornelius, I see a lot of my dad. Because my dad uh, was also, like I said, in the military. He was an officer in the military. And, and um, wherever we moved, we always got into a church, and he always surrounded himself with godly men. You know, and I didn't understand that growing up, but as an adult, I look back, and uh, I really respect the, the maturity they had as a young man, as a young parent, to put Christian men around himself. His library was full of books on biblical parenting. And I remember as a, as a kid with, like, a, kind of a low self-esteem, I'd look at the bookshelf and go, man, I must be screwed up. <laughs> you know, like, strong-willed child, you know, do, you know, every Dobson book, every, you know. And I'm like, man, I'm my dad is like either he's clueless or I'm just horrible, right? And as, as an adult, I look back and he's still got all his books and my sister's borrowing them all the time. And, um, and, you know, I said, he just, so much work was put in to being a spiritual leader in the home. And he didn't have that growing up. And he knew that it wasn't going to be easy, that he had to learn, that he had to put people around himself. And Cornelius was that kind of guy. He looked at others around him. And my dad didn't look at it for his own faith, not even for his kid's faith. But he still, um, like I said, reaches out to everybody in his family that he loves. And he's not giving up on any of them. And he's stepping into the gap where their dads uh, weren't there or just are failing to do that. And so I would just encourage every father in this room, it's not going to be easy. You're going to have to make some sacrifices. He gave up um, a lot to keep his integrity. I, I could talk for hours about the the opportunities that he missed because he wouldn't do certain things. and He just wouldn't um, rub elbows that kind of way, the way that they wanted him to, and um, the high roads that he took and the sacrifices he made that I didn't understand as a child, but I respect as an, old, an adult looking back. I saw him be the peacemaker in the family. Like I said, he eventually the family would get together with Thanksgiving and have a meal together, all of us. And uh, you know, at about 10 years old, um, I remember the first time my aunt came home to Indiana for Thanksgiving. And it was huge. It was the first time they'd done that since they were, uh, had left the house. And that was because of the work that my dad did um, to, to love her, to tell her that she was still valuable to the family, to, and to, to help others see her side and to bring them together. Um, by that time, you know, from 10 on, I just, it was kind of like the Angles. I mean, that's um, Little House on the Prairie for the millennials. In there. It was like the Angles. I mean, you wouldn't, the, the, the family that he grew up in and the family that we had from like 10 on, it was like polar opposites. You wouldn't even believe these were the same family. We loved each other. They would travel. We moved to Alaska when I was in high school. They, my grandparents flew to Alaska, took all the kids, and everybody came up, um, traveled thousands, you know, a thousand miles to come see us. And, I mean, it was just a great, loving family. I remember my grandfather would just show up. You know, he'd just walk through the front door. Hey, anybody home? You know, and, and he'd just give you a big hug and be like, oh, hey, grandparents are here. You know, it wouldn't matter where we lived. Um, they'd keep California, and they'd just pop in. And, just like, oh. and we just had this great family. But, but I don't tell you all this to brag on my dad. As proud as I am of my dad, I don't tell you that to brag on my dad this morning. I tell you that to brag on God. Because I've seen what God can do in when God can do that in that situation with that kind of angst and that kind of anger and that kind of res- just resistance and that kind of pushing away through one person's obedience. And I stand here today because my dad responded to a great God who can do great things with our obedience. I'm so grateful for that. And it goes beyond, um, it goes beyond happiness. It goes beyond uh, wealth or comfort. I'm talking spiritually. I don't know that I would have known Christ had it not been for my dad. And I certainly don't think my family would have known Christ had it not been for, for God reaching down and grabbing that one kid and saying, hey, it can be different. Watch what I can do in your life. My grandparents are gone now. Um, Just uh, great memories. 
I want you to remember this morning that uh, there are people on the other side of our obedience. There's people on the other side of your obedience. People on the other side of my obedience. And we need to be ready when they ask us for the reason that we believe. Let's pray together. Father, again, I thank you for what you've done in my life. And I pray that every person in this room would come to know you as their personal Savior. I pray for those that already know you, Lord, that they would live a life of integrity and be an example to their families and friends. I pray for those that don't know you yet, Lord, that they would not leave here today without making that commitment. I pray that we'd be the kind of church, the kind of people that people look to when they need a reason for the answer or for the reason for why we believe, Lord. Help us to be prepared, not with a canned answer, not with a stale answer, not with something that you did in our lives 20 years ago, something you've done in our lives today because we've walked with you in faith and we've we've kept that intimacy with you in prayer and in your word, Lord. Help us keep our eyes open to what you're doing in our life, Lord. Pray that you would inspire us, that you would keep our eyes open for those opportunities, those needs around us, Lord. And I just want to thank you that um, you're such a great example of a father, Lord. May we strive to be like you on this Father's Day. We just remember the gift that you gave us by putting your son, the most valuable thing to you, on a cross to redeem us for our sin, Lord. Thank you for our grace, for your grace, your mercy, your love. May you continue to use us for your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you.